Father God, we open your word and we pray once again that you would open our hearts that, Lord, we would be changed and that from the inside out. We thank you how, Lord, it was your conviction and the firm wear of our conscience that brought us to see our need for you. We thank you, Lord, that when we opened our hearts to you by faith, you forgave us our sins. You lifted the shame and the guilt, the anger from the ways we had lived before. And you placed your Holy Spirit in our hearts to change us. And so, Lord, we pray as we study through this chapter that we would allow the Spirit of God to do what he has been wanting to do in our lives, to make us more like you and to make us more useful for your work. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless and anoint your word to each heart that is here. We ask that you would do this for your body, the body of Christ, and for your glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 5, a reminder, <clears throat> we had an allegory, and that was verse 30, chapter 4, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture cast out the bondwoman, that was Hagar and her son Ishmael, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. And again, it was an analogy for us coming from the Old Testament. And so summing it up, so then, brethren, we're not children of the bondwoman. We weren't a work of the flesh. We're children of the free. We are by faith in a promise of God that he would deliver through his son salvation to the world. So chapter 5, so stand fast, therefore, in the liberty or in the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. Now, I've had some questions. Pastor, yep, uh, you say we're no, no longer under the law. True. So does that mean that we can claim Jesus' name and just live like lawless sort of, you know, out of control people? What's the answer? No. Well, then we're under the law. No. We'll let the chapter show us. Stand fast, therefore, in the freedom, the liberty, wherewith Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And again, from our analogy, that yoke is legalism. Don't go back to legalism and trying to, in a sense, impress God by what you do. Verse 2, behold, or see, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Now, listen, I have to slow down and explain a few things. One, in the Western world here, generally most males are circumcised, okay? And if you're thinking, I really didn't come to church for this, I just, I'm just laying it out, all right? So, and that was generally beyond your control. You were an infant, your parents made a decision, or they decided not, whatever way they went, okay. The crowd to whom he is writing at this time in Galatians, these are Gentiles, non-Jews. They would not generally circumcise, at least in the Greco-Roman world, their children. And so for a non-Jew to receive Jesus, they get saved. Well, this is great. Hallelujah. But then comes this sort of extra biblical doctrine, this extra teaching out there. Well, these Judaizing teachers say, yeah, that's great. You believe in Jesus, but you also need to obey Moses' law and you better be circumcised or you're not a real believer. That's what Paul has been dealing with in the book of Galatians. That's why I said, if anyone writes to you another gospel, let him be accursed, right? Because they're adding to it. So here for us, if, if you read this, you might say, well, uh, what is he talking about? Well, in that world at that time, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised as an adult who has now come to faith in Christ, so now you decide you better run out and get circumcised, he says, if you do this, Christ shall profit you nothing. Why? Because what you're saying by that action is what Jesus did for you on the cross and dying in your place, taking your sin and the wrath that it was due, shedding his blood to satisfy the law of God and fulfill these things isn't enough. You have to help out now by going and getting circumcised. In other words, you're going to add to what he did by some outside behavior. That's not the gospel. Just as today there are places where it will say to you, you're not a real believer unless you believe in Christ and you speak in tongues. Where did they get that from? 
What did we learn in Corinthians? God gives to every man, believers, a gift severally as he wills, right? We learned that. Chapter 12, we learned here the gifts. Chapter 14, we learned here's how you use them. What was the good stuff in the middle? Like an Oreo cookie? Love. And so there are doctrines even today, teachings that say, well, you're not a real Christian unless you do these things. Wait a second. The day you surrendered your heart and your will to Jesus Christ by faith and asked him into your heart to be your savior, that's the day you became a believer. Now, the rest of what God wants to do in your life, that's whatever blessing or gifting he desires to give to you. That doesn't change the fact that when you believed, you were made righteous through his work on your behalf. That was accomplished at the cross. He said, it is finished, not now it's your turn. It's finished. You simply believe upon that completed work of redemption. And the tomb is empty to prove God accepted it. It is the ultimate gift receipt. I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, <clears throat> you understand the context now. Christ shall profit you nothing. It's like you're adding to what he did. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Okay, if you want to play this game and you're going to start trying to keep the law, not only is circumcision part of it, there's another 612, 613 commandments behind it. Which, by the way, for most of us in the room, if, you know, I'm wearing, you know, sort of suit pants here, and they're polyester and something. I personally have a, a, my own theory. Suits are made of asbestos. <laughs> Perhaps you can relate, and I only wear them when I have to, but... For the Jew to wear an interwoven fabric was forbidden by the law. Why? Because the pagans interwove different types of fabric, wool and wool, linen, whatever. They interwove different things because they thought it gave them occult power. So God in the law, part of the 613, said to them, you will not mix these things because I don't want you to behave like the pagans. That's basically where he's going with it. Certain other things of the law, same thing. This is what the pagans did, thinking it gave them occult power. God said to his people, then you're going to be different. I don't want you doing these things. Now, we're not bound by that. But if you start with one thing, you got to keep going. So you might as well get off your nylon socks with, you know, rubber in them or whatever, elastic, because I testify to every man that is circumcised that now you're a debtor. He's a debtor to do the whole law. If you're going to play this game, verse 4, Christ has become, the idea is to render inactive, Christ has become of no effect unto you. You're taking it from here. Hang on, Lord, I'll finish it from here. How's that going to work? Not well. Christ has become of no effect. It's like you don't need him. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. You are leaving a gift and you're heading into a works-based legalistic relationship. And that's not what God accepts. That's what we learned in the analogy. Cast out the bondwoman. Okay. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness. What is our hope? 2016's election? You've heard the old saying. It's not the... Uh, Lesser of two evils that we have to choose from, but oftentimes it's the evils of two lessers. <laughs> Which one you pick? We'll get more into that as that season rolls around. If we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness, and that is Jesus' work in us, and is taking us to be home with him. We have been adopted. We are sons and daughters by faith. He blesses us in this life, and he's going to bring us to be with him in the life that is to come. And just a little personal aside, you're going to be in the life that is to come a lot longer than you're in this life. So you might want to make sure you choose eternal life. If we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith, for in Christ Jesus, verse 6, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision. It doesn't change your status with God. But faith... That's what brings us to God, a relationship with him by faith, like Abraham. But faith, which worketh by love. Verse 7, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? How many have ever seen, say, the pen relays? Right? It's the oval, and what's around the oval? The track, and what does the track have around it? Lines. And what are they supposed to do when they run? Stay within their line. Okay, same thing with the Olympics. You're supposed to stay in your line. 
Summer Olympics, the picture he uses is, you started running great in this race. Who knocked you out of your lane? Disqualifying you. You did run well. Who did hinder you or knock you off course like a runner that you should not obey the truth? Who's knocking you into this idea that you're going to finish the work of God through legalism? Where'd you get that from? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you, the Lord himself. What did he say in chapter 1? If any man preaches another gospel, let him be accursed, anathema. You're giving us a false message. This persuasion comes not of him that called you. He called you by faith, right? Through his grace. You see, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Once you start with a little bit, it just leads to more. Seldom, if ever, does the enemy come to you and say, you know what, jump into an affair with your neighbor's wife. What? What does he do first? Hey, go look at this. Go look at that. You know, you're not treated the way you should be, so go look at that. And pretty soon, boom. He always starts deviating us off small. Little things, attitudes, whatever. Where does he want to take you? Trash your witness. How does he get you there? It's got to start small. Little leaven begins to leaven the whole lump. Got to be careful. Same thing with legalism. You start doing a little bit, and pretty soon, you're completely relating to God based on your works, which he will not accept. That's a different gospel. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Verse 10, it's emphatic here. I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded. But he, these legalistic teachers who are preaching another gospel, he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment. And what was that judgment he called down on him? Anathema or be accursed, whoever or whosoever he be. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, wait a second, what is he saying? Question, was he just preaching circumcision that we had to have it to us in these last few verses? What's the answer? No. What did he say? Doesn't matter. Okay. So does Paul preach you got to be circumcised? No. We got one in the front. Anybody else? No. Well, then why is he bringing it up? Finish the verse. And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, which is a charge against him by these false teachers. If, as they say, is the idea, I preach this. Oh, yeah, you should do this. Paul preaches it, too, just not here at Galatia, but he preaches it everywhere else. He's dealing with that argument, that lie. If I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Pop quiz, and you have to respond with a hand vote. Who persecuted Paul the apostle more, the Gentiles or the Jews? How many say the Gentiles? How many say the Jews? You are absolutely right. Now, with that knowledge that you already know from reading your New Testament, put together this verse. And if I, brethren, yet preach circumcision, as these false legalistic teachers assert, why do I then suffer persecution from whom primarily? Jews. For then is the offense or the scandal on is the idea, this, this trap. Then is the offense of the cross ceased. If anything, the Jews should be happy and they'd stop persecuting me because they would then say I'm not against the law of Moses and I am making people believe upon Jesus but keep the law. It should be reducing my persecution. So if I preach like these false teachers say I do circumcision, why are the Jews so angry with me? How many follow the verse now? That's what he's saying. In other words... Come on, I don't preach that. That's part of the reason I'm in such hot water with the Jews. Verse 12. I would, little Pauline humor, I would that they were even amputated, cut off, which trouble you. You see what he's saying? They're so interested in cutting something off, why not them from your life? Verse 13. For brethren, we have been called unto liberty. Amen? Amen. Well, then we can do whatever we want. Keep reading. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the laws fulfilled in one word. Hold it. Left turn. Matthew 22. Let's let the Lord tell us this one. Matthew 22. Jesus was asked by the Sadducees about the resurrection, which they don't believe in. He completely schools them on the five books of Moses that they hold to. 
sends them down in flames in one question and destroys essentially their whole reason for being. It's an amazing confrontation. Matthew 22, 33, after that, when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. <laughs> he had nuked them. But when the Pharisees heard that he had put the Sadducees, note this, to silence, totally unhorsed them. They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment, verse 36, in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy soul, all of thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, coming from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law, which is about walking rightly with God and about not doing wrong things to your neighbor, and the prophets, which was about you've left God, come back to him. On all these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So back to our chapter. For the law is fulfilled interpersonally in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The word is agape. It's used to describe the love of Christ. God so agape the world, he gave his only begotten son. It is a love like any other, unlike any other love you encounter. It is the love of God being poured into your heart. All the law is fulfilled in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. How many have heard of the Ten Commandments? Ten of you. Do you remember the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus came to him and he said, you have heard that it is said you shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, he is speaking in his own authority. Don't miss that. I say unto you, if a man or a woman, look after a man or a woman, and lust after him in their heart, they are already an adulterer before God. How many remember that? If you're angry with your brother without a cause, I say to you, you're already a murderer. He said, you shall not murder, but I say unto you, if you're angry with your brother without a cause, you're already a murderer. You see, the Jews had the law, the external. Well, haven't done that, not outwardly, but inwardly you have. Having come to Christ, God begins to not only get rid of outward behavior in our lives that shouldn't be there, but the Spirit of God moving into our hearts begins also to deal with attitude, right? So let's look for a minute, Exodus 20. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read them to you. But let's consider now here the Ten Commandments in the Spirit. Okay, so it says, let's work backwards just for sake of argument. You shall not covet. And there Moses said, don't covet your neighbor's wife, his manservant, maidservant, uh, his BMW, his, his Pontiac, his Buick, you know, his, his oxen, his donkey, his whatever, mode of transportation. Don't covet them. Okay, that's the law. Don't covet them. But with the Spirit of God in our heart, rather than say, well, things don't look good in their marriage, this is my chance to slide in. With the Spirit, it's, Lord, heal their marriage, help them to appreciate what they have in each other, bring peace to their home, bring them to you. Not, gee, why did he get the promotion, or why does that neighbor have this or that? But you know what, Lord, I thank you that you bless them, and you know, Lord, I thank you that you'll meet my, need, you'll meet my needs also according to your riches and glory. You see, when you walk in the Spirit, you don't covet, you don't bear false witness, you don't steal, you don't commit adultery, you don't kill, and you do honor your father and mother, even if it's challenging. So even though you're not bound by the law, having received the spirit of God in your heart, you not only often will walk in what the law says is right, but you actually go beyond it. No, you're not committing adultery. And because Christ's in your heart, you're even dealing with, you know what? I can't think this about that person. God, forgive me. It went beyond observing the law. It went all the way to the heart. Interesting. Back to our chapter. If you love your neighbors yourself, and this one commandment you fulfill, he said, all the law, at least towards our fellow man. But if you bite and devour one another, whether it's division over false teachers, splits within the church, attitudes about other people, if you bite and devour one another, take heed, blepo, see, watch out, that you be not consumed one of another. You know, they say nothing travels faster than a rumor in the church. 
By the way, we have a good one to report, and that is we've learned, we've heard, and hopefully you have too, Pastor Saeed has been released from his imprisonment in Iran. <laughs> Praise God for that. He has been horribly tortured at times. Someone, uh, Dave, told me just after service, apparently he has left the country. He's now out of Iran. We'll know for sure during the day if that's true. My wife and I ended up in Russia. God's delivered God's grace and provision, I guess, in a sense, and delivered us into a whole lot of learning. And we showed up when a ministry was already in pretty bad shape, and about a month after we got there, it more or less fell apart. We showed up as people were aggressively biting and devouring each other. And guess what happens when you show up and you're new? Guess who they turn their attention to? We got bitten, devoured as well. And we watched actually the thing get consumed one of another. You may not pay much attention to that verse until you've lived through it and you've watched people, whether it's a prayer church ministry, a, a homeschool co-op, or it's, it's a shame when you see people get into the flesh and begin to bite and to devour one another. But all the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbors yourself. And one of the first ways you'll show you love your neighbors yourself is you don't bite and devour them. Here it was doctrinal issues and other things. But generally speaking, it's the body of Christ that should be looking out and encouraging each other. Yes, we have the right to speak truth to one another. But speak truth to them, not to everybody else but them. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed, lest you be consumed Take heed that you be not consumed one of another. So verse 16, this I say then, here's where I'm going. Walk in the spirit. Now, for most of us, there are some here today that it is either impossible or extremely painful. And for them, we're sorry. But for most of us, walking is quite easy and also quite natural. It just happens. Little guys learn how to do it. I say then, walk. It should just be part of how you live. Common, easy, simple. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Why? You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You see, let me explain. Before you got saved, it was an all-flesh weekend. You go to the bar, she pays attention to you. Hey, I got a chance. You move. You're out, you know, your buddies show up. Hey, you, what, you knock down a bunch of beers. Uh, let's go ahead and get toasted. You do it. There's an opportunity. You know what? If I fudge this or do that, I, that could, I could have that. You take it. You didn't go, gee, should I? It was an all flesh weekend. What are you wrapped in? Flesh. And without the spirit of God in you, it was just, I'm just going to do what I want. Nobody's going to. And maybe once in a while, your conscience tried to give a vote or an opinion. Hey, and you just knocked it down with something else. Go away. It was an all flesh weekend. And then you met God. And then the Spirit of God moved in by faith in Christ. And then, in case you didn't know, a battle began. Look what he tells us. You see, walk in the Spirit, having been born again, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, which, by the way, you're still wrapped in. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. How many have figured that out in their own Christian walk? Okay, a few of you. And the spirit, basically same idea, lust or is pushing back against the flesh. These are contrary, literally adversary, in a sense they're at war in trenches. These are contrary the one to the other. How many have learned this? You didn't worry about this when you were unsaved. Then you open your heart to Jesus and you get saved. And God begins to say things to you like, I want drinking out of your life. Oh, well, God, I mean, you know, where are you going to go? God eventually, and it's different. Is it wrong to have a drink? No. Is it wrong to be drunk? Yes. But could God tell you you're to be done with this? Sure. And if he does, what should you do? Submit to him. <laughs> it's easier. God worked some things out of my life. I had no idea why at the time, but I learned over time, this is where he put me. Makes sense now. Back then, it was, you know, and he would always put it to me this way. He's good. <laughs> he would say, which do you love more? This or what I have for you? Gee, where do you go with that one? Checkmate, Lord. I love you more than I love this. And yet sometimes we hold on so hard to it. Like, well, mm, 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 you know, and, and 
uh, you know what, Lord, I love you more than this. And what I have found every time, whether it was entertainment choices, music choices, other things, these Larrys of Liberty, every time God began to challenge me and say, I want this gone for my purposes. And it could be anger, unforgiveness, bitterness, could be other things. Every time the Lord has laid that on my heart, this needs to go. And I've finally, by the grace of God, been able to say, I'm sorry, Lord, it needs to go. I give it up. He has always given something better. Every time. This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, again, in case you don't know, lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary at war, the one with the other, so that you cannot do the things you would. Romans 7, it's what Paul was saying. That that I want to do, I don't. That that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Christ Jesus. He delivers us. Yesterday was a momentous day in the Swanson household. And that is because little Whitney Jane got her first taste of food at a ripe 10 months. And so we put her in a high chair and everybody's around, you know, and all that. And, and Lori gets a little bit of, you know, Berber, Gerber baby food and stirs it up and comes in with a spoon. And most kids are, pat, 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 pat. Whitney grabbed her hand and thump, shoved the spoon in and just started chewing away. We're like, hmm, clearly she's been observing dinner and knows what she's missing. And she just, no, she just ate it. No texture issues, just kept going. And, and having worked before at Macamecos in the beach in Ocean City, I used to make pizzas. So that night was homemade pizza night, making pizzas. So we gave her some crust. And now she's holding the crust. She's gumming on. She has what we call hippo teeth, two on the top, two on the bottom, little wedge in between. You know, and she's sitting there. And she was so happy. She was just like, yes. <laughs> And she sat there gnawing on her crust. What we've learned over the years, what you feed grows, what you starve dies. When you became a believer, the Spirit of God took up residence in your heart by faith. And it fights against your flesh. But if you're constantly feeding your flesh, that's what's growing in your life. If you were to take a look at your week's schedule, last week, the kind of entertainment, things online, conversations, the way that you behaved, if you were to look at the last seven days of your life and take an analysis of your own stock, of your own self, what have I fed more, my flesh or the Spirit of God? If you can take an honest evaluation and look and say, you know, I've been wrestling with mm -mm, all this stuff, is it perhaps because you have been feeding the wrong side of your, man, of your person, the flesh? Because what you feed will grow. What you starve will die. You begin to put off the things that used to feed that flesh, and you begin to take your heart and your mind and put it into the Word of God and spend time with Him. You'll grow spiritually. But like Jane, little Whitney there, you've got to decide what you're bringing in. You got to decide where you're going to renew yourself and feed. You see, the beauty of this is if you're, well, how do I know what's good and what's bad? He gave us a checklist. It's right here. In fact, when we do the premarital class, we get into, listen, before a wife is called to submit to her husband as Christ is to the church, or a husband is called to love his wife like Christ did the church and died for her. Before you, either of you get into your role as a husband and wife, in Ephesians 5.21, it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Then, wives submit to your husbands, husbands love your wives. Before either of you do your assigned roles, make sure you check in first and you're walking one another in the fear of God, submitting to one another in the fear of God. You see, if you're in the fear of God, you're not in the flesh. If you're in the fear of God, you're doing what honors him. It's very easy to submit to a godly man who's not in the flesh. It's very easy to love a godly woman who's not in the flesh. You stay within that safe sandbox of the fear of God. And it'll make it so easy to do your job as husband and wife. Well, how do, I, I step, how do I know when I've stepped out of that sandbox? That is the list contained here. So the good news is he's given us a list that we can use to judge our behavior. The bad news is we're out of time. We've got to do it next week. So let's stand and let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. And Lord, you are the good shepherd. As we learned on Wednesday night, Psalm 23 you maketh lie down in green pastures. 
According to those who claim they know, sheep who are hungry will not lie down. Green pastures are exactly where they need to be fed. And the beauty, Lord, of a green pasture is no matter how much you feed on it, it continues to grow and to minister to you. So I pray for your, your body, your flock, that they would find themselves spending the time in the green pastures, fed from the word of God, spending time renewing their minds with you, and perhaps that unforgiveness, that anger, that pornography, that alcohol, that drug use, the things that have owned them, they finally find the grace of God to be free of. Lord, be with us as your body. Strengthen us, we pray, by the Spirit. And let us walk with you in a way that you are well pleased to call us your own. Help us this week, we pray in Jesus' name.